Over to you. Thank you, Zanera. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Hope you're doing well. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Isha, and I'm the community manager at NIC. Um, this is a small initiative that we are doing uh, in collaboration with the Feroz Sons and the Corporate Coalition. It is a hackathon for hepatitis. Uh, we know that this is a problem in our country. It's a global problem, but more prevalent in our country. Um, we've launched this hackathon to try and find innovative solutions to the problems that arise from the onspread of hepatitis and how to stop this, essentially. Um, this panel discussion is our small effort of creating awareness. We're going to talk more about, um, you know, what's happening in the world, what are some innovative ways of combating, eradicating um, the menace that is hepatitis C. Um, we have a wonderful panel here with us, um, and our moderator for today is uh, Yamna Hasni. Yamna has over nine years of experience in the development sector. Um, she also holds a master's degree in public policy from Australia. Yeah. Um, I do a quick uh, introduction of the panelists, and then Yamna, of course, can do a more detailed one. Um, we have with us Dr. Huma Qureshi, um, Dr. Asad Ali Chaudhary, and Dr. Saeed Sadi Khamid. And we also have uh, Usman Wahid Saab, who's the CEO of the Rosans Laboratories, um, joining us in the panel today. Just a quick one, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature um, that you can see at the bottom. Um, and we'll be taking your questions regarding applications, regarding the discussion as we go along. Um, Yamna, over to you, good luck. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for joining in, embracing the miracle of technology. We have our amazing panelists from all over Pakistan. Uh, so let me just give a little introduction of all our panelists. We have Dr. Homa Chaudhary, uh, Dr. Homa Qureshi. She's the member of the Pakistan National Bioethics Committee, and she's also the part of the Technical Advisory Group on Hepatitis. She is a graduate of the Dow Medical College. Thank you so much, Dr. Homa Qureshi, for joining. And then we have Dr. Asad Ali. He's the Vice Chairman of Parsa Trust. He's the Director, Parsa Health Net, Echo Pakistan. That's very interesting. We would like to know more about what Echo Pakistan does. He's also the Senior Vice President of the Pakistan Society of Hepatology. Then we have Dr. Saeed Sadek Hamid. He's the professor at the Department of Medicine and director of the clinical trial unit at Aar Khan University. And last but not the least, we have Mr. Usman Khalid, CEO of Ferocin Laboratory Limited. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. And for all of those who've tuned in, our topic today is about hepatitis C. We're trying to find out why Pakistan has the second highest burden of disease. Why are the incidents and why are the cases so high in our country? Uh, so I believe according to WHO, 8.6% of Pakistanis, they suffer from hepatitis C. The various reasons for that, many, most of the common reasons are oversharing of needles. It is the lack of uh, proper procedures during blood transfusions, also negligent uh, malpractices. That's also another reason, poor sterilization of needles. But I'm not going to talk about hepatitis C. We have our brilliant experts to talk about. So in this panel discussion, we'll understand the context of the disease. We will talk about the treatment and the drug options available, the amazing research that is happening in Pakistan, and then also talk about the private-public partnerships and models that the government can use in trying to manage and detect hepatitis C in the country. So let's start with Dr. Huma. Dr. Huma Qureshi, if you can please enlighten us, uh, what is hepatitis C? What are the basic causes and the ways of transmission of this disease? Uh, thank you very much, Yomna, and uh, hi, everybody. Uh, this is Dr. Huma. Uh, so I'll, I'll update you about uh, the disease that uh, it was in 2008 that uh, I, uh, my team and uh, my, uh, myself, we did the hepatitis survey for the whole country. And that survey was done by the Pakistan Medical Research Council, which I was heading at that time. And that survey showed that we had a 5% prevalence of hepatitis C in the country, which meant that out of 20 people, there was one person who was infected. Uh, and that survey also showed us that what are the risk factors or what are the causative agents of this disease in our country. So the risk factors uh, were four. 
uh, and they're still there, uh, unsafe in, uh, blood transfusion, uh, which means that it is the blood that we receive is not properly screened. And then we have unsafe injection practices. And these injections are the therapeutic injections that we take for our common ailments. These are not the intravenous drug users that they, who use the you know, syringes, uh, they share the syringes. So the healthcare providers and the, and the quacks and all others uh, are, are reusing the syringes and the needles uh, uh, just because of cost saving. So actually it's the, not a non-awareness of the healthcare providers, uh, uh, you know, attitude that we are getting the disease. And the third thing was the very poor infection control practices in our health, healthcare settings. So by and large, we see that all the infection is actually coming from the healthcare settings, the unsafe blood, the injections and the infection control, like, you know, the dental practices, the surgeries and all others that uh, we uh, undergo in the hospitals. Uh, so this survey ha had put Pakistan as the second country in the world with the highest prevalence of hepatitis C. Then uh, because it was like uh, almost a decade old uh, survey, so then in 2018, Punjab did the survey for the province and in 2019-20, uh, I did the SIN survey. So the two surveys where we put together, this almost, uh, you know, covers 80% of the population. So that survey showed that from 5% prevalence, now our prevalence has gone up to 7.5%. So it has jumped 2.5%. So what it actually means in the real numbers, it means that almost about 7 million people have the disease because, you know, then uh, we have to check them for the virus and then, you know, some have virus, some don't. So rather than taking you through those mathematics, I'm trying to just put it clear to you all that uh, the calculations show that almost 7 million people in Pakistan are carrying the virus. And then we also did analysis and we asked the Center for Disease Data Analysis, Homi Razabi, who is in uh, USA, uh, to model for us that, uh, you know, how many people have been treated and how many have been cured and how many still need to be tested and treated. So he calculated that as of 2020, which is last year, out of the 7.3 million people that we have with the disease, actually only 2 million have been tested and put to treatment. Uh, in fact, only 2 million have been tested and out of these 2 million, only uh, 4.3 4, 4, 4, 30, uh, 4 five lakhs have been treated. So you see, it's, 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 it's actually a drop in the ocean that uh, out of 7 million people, we have just treated about uh, 435,000 people, which, which is like nothing. Uh, so, but the good thing about uh, um, us is that, you know, Pakistan is producing the a very effective locally produced drugs uh, for hepatitis C in Pakistan. And these drugs are very, very effective. So once you treat anybody who has the disease, uh, almost all, you know, like 98% get cured. Uh, so, so all I'm just trying to give you the good news is that, you know, if we diagnose people early or whenever we diagnose them, the moment you put, we put them on these medicines, we can, we can almost certify that 98% would be cured. So, uh, then, then, then you know that uh, WHO, uh, which is the authority on health for uh, the whole world, uh, has said that by 2030, all countries in the world have to eliminate hepatitis uh, from their, uh, you know, from the globe. Uh, so we have also been given those targets to eliminate. And with this high burden of disease, we think uh, that uh, it is kind of almost impossible. Uh, to, uh, you know, cure these uh, 7.3 million people. And what calculations we have done is that if, if every year we treat about a million cases every year, then by 2030, we should be able to cure the and eliminate the disease from Pakistan. And, you know, 1 million disease, 1 million treating 1 million people every year is a huge target. And frankly, you know, the Prime Minister of Pakistan is about to launch this program for the elimination of hepatitis in Pakistan. Plus, you know that all the provinces have their own chief minister's program of hepatitis, which are working. So the two programs together 
are, are really now trying to work and do this activity over the next 10 years so that we are able to eliminate the disease by 2030. Uh, and, and this we can't do alone. The government cannot do this all alone. On, and for this, uh, we need uh, obviously partners or, or people like you uh, who could kind of be partner with us to have good information systems, good messages going out so that people come out for testing. We need very effective testing and treatment sites where if they, people go, then the sites are working. They should not go and find out that the site is not there or it's not working. Uh, we need very strong public-private partnership because, you know, the government alone, as I told you, can't do all this again. And then, obviously, apart from testing and treatment the of the population, we also need to work on the prevention. Because, you know, if you don't close the tap and, the, you know, the, the, the disease continues to pour in, then, you know, uh, you, you, you will never be able to achieve the elimination. So, we need to work together as a, as a country, as a group, as collaborators. And but it is doable. Egypt has done it, and I'm sure we can also do it. But we need partners like you all. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Homa. And you talked about public-private partnerships. So I'd like to ask Dr. Asad about his experience, and he is uh, a part of the Echo Project. So, sir, why don't you please enlighten us about the different stakeholders and the different public-private partnerships that exist in our country that uh, the government can adopt or that have successful outcomes? Would you please like to talk about the public-private partnerships? Thank you, thank you, Amna. Uh, uh... Thanks very much uh, uh, to the host for inviting me. And Dr. Huma has given uh, an overview of the situation. And I tell you, uh, it is bad. And unfortunately, it's about a virus where we have treatment. Uh, for one virus, we have an effective vaccine like hepatitis B. And for hepatitis C, we have an excellent treatment. And as Dr. Huma pointed out, uh, it cannot be done alone. Uh, it's not uh, the duty of the government alone. So we all have to join hands. Uh, the, I come uh, from a background where over the last 15 years or so, uh, I worked with, uh, with uh, the NGOs and philanthropy support and uh, worked very closely with Dr. Huma, uh, with their NGO, which is a health foundation in Karachi. And I have worked with Gujranwala Liver Foundation and now with Pastor Trust uh, in Gujranwala. And uh, we've tried to get them together and find out ways how to go about eliminating hepatitis C. And we face a huge challenge. We have a few pluses uh, in, in our war against hepatitis. Uh, we now have a, little, uh, a more robust infrastructure support. Government is keen, provincial, federal governments, they have their hepatitis control program. Uh, I can say uh, we have resources in terms of uh, the tests have gone cheaper. Uh, we have, due uh, to the local manufacturing, we have very effective drugs which are within the range uh, even for people to buy and the government is putting a lot of money in. And this is a very effective treatment and uh, very good success rates. Uh, but where we lack is will to do and we know the numbers and we know the numbers well. But have, have we been able to reach out to those numbers? In hepatitis B, 10% of the people are aware they have got hepatitis B. In hepatitis C, 20% uh, of the people who suffer, they are aware. So 80 to 90% of the people who have got the disease, who are there, uh, you know, roaming amongst all of us, they are unfortunately unaware. And, and this is where the, the whole campaign started of finding the missing millions. So we have made a lot of uh, voice about finding the missing millions, but now working with NGOs, uh, with, uh, uh, with, uh, with various community workers, uh, there is another challenge. It's not about the missing millions alone, it's about the unwilling millions. There are people who do not want to get tested. And there are a lot of myths about it. And one of the major reasons is stigma associated with being diagnosed hepatitis B and C. You may lose your job. You, it, it may have implications on your family relations. So there's a whole lot of things that, that are going on. 
So we need to work very, very hard with civil society. When we talk about partnership, I think we have a lot of ammunition in our armamentarium, but at the same time, we need to utilize that very well. And all of us have a duty to do here. Civil society has a duty to do here. Uh, uh, we, uh, like uh, Usman may tell us more about the corporate coalition for viral hepatitis elimination, uh, where uh, they have to pledge that they're not gonna fire anybody if he's tested positive for hepatitis B or C. In my experience, in one of the big uh, industry here in Gujrawala, uh, about uh, 3000 employees, only 800 people came forward to get tested. So, so they, they, this is where we, 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 you know, face the challenge. The other thing is about, uh, uh, as you mentioned, ECHO. Uh, ECHO is basically a, a project of University of New Mexico and it stands for Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes. And here we are working uh, uh, in capacity building. And what we are doing is to reach out to pri primary care physicians across Pakistan and we are upgrading their knowledge about hepatitis C. What we want is the because the treatment is simple, very few side effects, very effective treatment. All they need to know is whom to treat and whom to refer. We have very simple algorithms for uh, triaging the patients. So 80% of the people or maybe more than that can be safely treated at home and with a 97 98% success rate so we we can really take care of the people because they most of the people in Pakistan the poor people in Pakistan they are daily wage workers they are not going to travel long distances miss their uh, because they, it, it, it just missed the, the whole day's wage for them so so we are working with them uh, at the same time we are into raising awareness. We are engaging students, which is we have a project by the name of Payam, which is Project Echo Youth Ambassador Movement, where we are uh, uh, imparting knowledge to high school students. Uh, we are making use of storytellers uh, to uh, reach out to primary schools, middle schools, grade five to eight, where we, with the help of stories, we tell them what is the cause of spread of hepatitis C or hepatitis B, how it can be prevented, what sorts of treatment or vaccination that is available and how they help. So through Project ECHO, we are reaching out to every nook and corner, I can say, of Pakistan. And inshallah, in due course of time, we will be working with the government also to spread this knowledge. Thank you very much. I'll stop here so you can carry on the discussion. Great. So both our panelists, you've talked about the detection and you've talked about treatment as well. And you've said that the treatment is fairly easy and it's affordable. So I'm going to now ask Mr. Usman Mahid if he can talk about, from his perspective, from the pharmaceutical industry, what are the drugs available? And as we've already talked about that, 70% out-of-pocket expenses are borne by the common Pakistani. So how expensive are these drugs? Can you please uh, talk take us through the pharmaceutical industry strands and talk about the drugs that are available. Usman sahab, your mic is muted. Thank yes, you, okay. I hope you can hear me now. Now I so can. the landscape okay. of treating hepatitis C uh, has changed dramatically over the time since we've been involved as a company with treatment. Uh, you know, we started working in Hep C in 2003. Uh, the available treatment was an injection called interferon which used to be given three times a week, had very low uh, cure rates, roughly around 50%, was very, very painful. Patients used to get fever, neutropenia, and it used to cost anywhere between 50 and 60,000 rupees a patient at that time. Uh, then a couple of years later, in the late 2000s, this uh, a long acting version of the same drug, regulated interferon, became available. Uh, some companies, including ours, began producing it locally which didn't bring the cost down, but it was still 60,000 rupees a patient. And again, cure rates of maybe 60, 65%, 70% at most. But in 2013, there was a global revolution in the hepatitis C space. These oral uh, directly acting antivirals were developed by a company in the US called Gilead Sciences. And we, have, we had the good fortune of partnering with them. 
uh, they created a drug called Sovaldi, which became a, one of the world's biggest blockbusters at that time. And with a six month course of Sovaldi, with minimal side effects, as Dr. Asad and Dr. Homa were mentioning, you could actually you know, achieve very high cure rates. And since that time, not only has that treatment become more effective, you have combination pills. So one tablet, which has two ingredients that can be taken once a day for only three months. In 12 weeks, you have a 98% cure rate with virtually minimal side effects, as low a side effect as the therapeutic drug can provide. So the scientific part of the challenge of treating hepatitis C, unlike COVID-19, this is a virus we know very well now. It's a virus we know how to beat, it's a virus we know how to address. And if you cost from, say, 150,000 rupees in the early 90s, today, in today's currency terms, a patient could cure themselves even out of their own pocket in less than 10,000 rupees. So it's become much more affordable to access this treatment. And this is if you pay out of pocket. There are many uh, NGOs. Uh, all the three panelists that are here today, uh, other than me, are involved in running some of those NGOs, providing free treatment. And provincial governments, like the government of Punjab, uh, Punjab right now is treating 50,000 patients as we speak uh, with an attempt to cure them. So there are large provincial programs that are also involved. Uh, so in a sense, you know, the scientific part, the treatment part is already taken care of. You can't get more effective than 98% cure rates and minimal side effects. You have diagnostics that are now easily accessible, cheap. So you can reach the patients where they live. The challenge really now, and this is why this is such a wicked problem, the problem of hepatitis C, is that despite being so easy to diagnose and fix, we still have 11 million people who don't know they have it, who are not reaching out to get treated, who are not getting rid of this virus. And if they don't get rid of it, there is a significant chance that they will go on very silently to greater degrees of illness. And ultimately, it is often manifests itself in liver cancer. And that's where you know, serious events like death occur. So the challenge of hepatitis C, and this is what I would like to really pose for the people who are participating in the hackathon, is not so much finding a scientific solution, it's finding a logistical a communication, a marketing solution. We need to market the fact that this is an easily curable disease. It's no longer the Kala Yarkan that used to be, it used to be known as 10, 15 years ago. It's not the case of death. Uh, uh, Dr. Asad mentioned the Corporate Coalition for Hepatitis Elimination. This is a group of companies we're very fortunate to have their support. They're also uh, supporting this, this very activity and the hackathon. It's a group of Pakistan's largest employers. Between them, they, they employ about 200,000 people. And as employers, these companies have committed that A, they will not uh, discriminate against anybody who has hepatitis C. So nobody will lose their job if they, if they are diagnosed positive. If they found to be positive, these companies are committed to helping them get diagnosed, achieve treatment, and cure. And then beyond that, beyond their immediate employee base, the companies are also committed, as you can see today, to spreading the message, to reaching a greater audience, and to making sure that as a country, we're able to... Uh, tackle this very large, but at its essence, very simple problem now. As I said, it's much more about marketing, communication, and logistics than science. Perfect. And we'll talk about uh, communication strategies and community engagement in a little while. But uh, let's include Dr. Saeed in the conversation. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Uh, so, Dr. Saeed, can you please tell us about the research that Aar Khan University is doing and also about the surveillance models that uh, you have developed or that are being followed in Pakistan to detect and manage hepatitis C? From your very research perspective, what would you like to share? Thank you, Yamna. Let me, first of all, just add on to some of the statistics that have already been thrown out there. First of all, liver cancer has been mentioned. So hepatitis C is the biggest cause of liver cancer in our country. About 60 to perhaps 70% of our liver cancers are due to hepatitis C directly. Liver cancer is one of the most lethal cancers. It is amongst the first top five lethal cancers because it, is, uh, it, it, it presents late in most people and there is not good enough treatment, particularly uh, in our countries because the treatments for these things are very, very expensive. So uh, people generally die when they develop liver cancer and they die quickly. That is the point number one to remember. Secondly, let me give you another statistic. And this is something that, that I don't like to do too much, but still I think that is a, a fact. So uh, since... Uh, February 2020, 2020, and now we're into 21, about, let's say, 18 months or 17 months, 
COVID has killed about 23,000 people. Now, each one of those deaths is deplorable, of course, and, and, and uh, condemnable uh, and, and a waste of life. But if you, if you compare this to deaths that occur due to hepatitis, to viral hepatitis, both hepatitis B and C in this country, they are about uh, close to 30,000 per year. And that has happened every year, day, year in and year out for many, many years. And that mortality still hasn't started to go down because as has been said a number of times in the conversation, we have hardly been able to treat people uh, in, the, in the manner that we, that we can, which is, which is a shame because we have all the tools as has been mentioned. So why have we not been able to do this? Uh, sorry, just one more statistic. HIV, our HIV population, particularly P HIV uh, uh, people who inject drugs and have HIV, 90% of them are co-infected with hepatitis C virus, 90%, which is one of the highest figures that is anywhere in the world for, uh, for people who inject drugs and who also have HIV. So uh, uh, terrible statistics, and, and, and I'm sorry that these are, these are so gloomy. But anyway, this is something that we need to face. Now, why is why are we not moving the needle? That is something that we have to, uh, had to uh, tackle the question fair and square. In 2019, uh, at the World Hepatitis Day, we assembled a global group of leaders in viral hepatitis uh, on the platform uh, in, in, in collaboration with the Al Khan University, the WHO, uh, and, uh, and, and a couple of other partners. And there was a big hoo-ha and um, the, prior, the Prime Minister's uh, 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 Special Assistant on Health, Dr. Zafar Mirza, in the, in the uh, concluding session, uh, got up and announced a very ambitious Prime Minister's program uh, for hepatitis, hepatitis C eradication, elimination in the country. Uh, now we are into 2021 and nothing has happened at all. Uh, fair enough, there's been COVID in the way and so on. Uh, but I think uh, with COVID now, hopefully receding, uh, viral hepatitis should gain center ground. Uh, so the point that I'm trying to make is that the, 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 the basic ingredient that is missing is the political will. And if you compare the situation with Pakistan to, to, to that of Egypt, which has already been mentioned, the single uh, item that was, that was operative in the Egyptian uh, program was the will of the president of Egypt, whoever that was at that time, I don't know. Uh, but that person took it as his own personal challenge to eradicate or eliminate, sorry, not eradicate, but eliminate hepatitis C from Egypt. And it was done within five years, not five, 10 years, not 12 years, within five years. They, they started to screen and they screened like mad. They screened about 5 million people every year or something like that until, until everything was done. Uh, so we need to find, we need to find ways to, to garner that political will. And I think programs like this will certainly help. Uh, I hope a good number of people are watching and they will take this to uh, to their uh, to their respective constituencies, what we've managed to do in the in the in the interim is that we've had we've, we've been able to put hepatitis C into what are called disease uh, the diseases of priorities disease priorities list. There is a list uh, that that countries develop, which uh, uh, on which they 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 wish to concentrate their 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 public money uh, for for health and and hepatitis C is now in there. Uh, let's hope that there is progress in that, in that area. Coming to uh, the, the research, uh, what we have been doing uh, are what are called micro-elimination projects. And micro-elimination projects in, in a sense mean uh, that you pick up a group of people, you pick up an area, you pick up a geographical boundary, and you try and eliminate hepatitis C from that particular group or that particular locality or that particular area. We've been working in, in, in Malir district in Karachi or, or a very urban area of Karachi um, in, in a couple of, 
now in actually three union councils of, of Malay district, uh, where we have so far screened about 18,000 subjects and we, 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 we diagnosed and we have started on treatment about 1,200 subjects so far. Uh, the prevalence in this area uh, for, for being positive for the hepatitis C antibody, not the PCR, which is the diagnostic test, is over 10%. So you can imagine that uh, this is a, a highly endemic area, uh, which, is, uh, which is almost totally neglected uh, uh, in, this, in, this, uh, in this disease process. Uh, so that is, that is one part that we are, that we are doing. Uh, in, in, within this larger project, we, we do smaller demonstration projects. For example, the one that we're starting now is what is called self-testing of hepatitis C uh, virus uh, so that people can do their tests at home and you don't have to run after them and, and so on. And uh, let's see if that is feasible in our population. And we, um, we hope that we can, we can uh, uh, you know, benefit from this. Last point, um, uh, we at the Khan University have, have tried very hard that, the, that AKU being a private organization should be part of this larger uh, uh, effort in eliminating hepatitis C from Pakistan. And I'm pleased to tell you that recently we signed uh, contracts from a couple of, with a couple of uh, private uh, partners. So these are private, private partnerships whereby 12,000 people will be treated in our smaller peripheral centers. Uh, those who are zakat, mustahik will be treated free of charge for everything, for, for, from diagnosis to, to, to doctors, to treatment and so on. Uh, those who are not zakat, mustahik uh, may have to pay a little bit of money, but not, not a great deal. Uh, so hopefully uh, uh, those are some of the contributions that we will continue to make uh, towards the uh, uh, towards the larger goal of elimination of hepatitis C from this country. Thank you. Great. And uh, Mr. Usman, uh, I'll start from you. You talked about how there is, and I think Dr. Uh, Mr. Usman and Dr. Asad, both of you talked about the stigma that people have about this disease. Um, can you tell me some of the taboos, what you've encountered, what are people's perception? And what from what I've been able to gather is that a common man, they're not even aware of this. Uh, and uh, in some hindsight, people of Pakistan have so many other diseases to worry about. And now we've added another thing on the list. Um, so what are the taboos that people face um, when another person tells them that they are suffering from hepatitis C? So uh, Yamna, as I mentioned uh, earlier, that uh, it was very well, sort of the big label for hepatitis C for many, many decades was Kala Yaka, the Black Death. So one, one uh, the stigma was that you're almost guaranteed to die once you have the disease. So many people would just prefer not to find out. You know, we're fatalistic as a nation anyway. Why, why put yourself through the misery of knowing you have something that you, might, you will likely die of? The fact is that you don't have to die of it at all. You can get rid of it in weeks. So that, that's one larger, broader stigma. But even amongst the educated elite, uh, even corporate employers, one of the exercises we had to do when the coalition was being formed was inform, uh, inform companies that somebody who is working in your production line, who is working in your kitchens even, cannot easily pass on hepatitis C. It's a blood-borne disease. You don't get it by shaking hands. You don't get it by hugging people. It's literally born, uh, born through transmission of. So anything that you know a worker can normally do, perform an office job, perform a labor job, but it doesn't involve blood to blood exchange. Really, there is almost no risk of them being a threat to their colleagues, their co-workers, other employees. Uh, so th these are some of the sort of very primary risks. And I know of large banks, large corporates that used to immediately fire people, immediately fire them mm -hmm. if their test came out positive. And even today, parts of the Middle East, if you have a hepatitis C a positive report, you're, you're denied a visa. You, you don't get a job. And there's no real scientific rationale behind that. So there's still a lot of work to do in this area. And Dr. Asit can add, I'm sure. Uh, uh, you, you're right, Usman. And uh, in our setting, uh, especially in the family setup, I remember in the interpron days uh, when uh, it was expensive and full of side effects. Uh, I still remember 
uh, people coming to our clinics and uh, it, it, it's it's very hard but i have to say it that uh, for a female who get tested positive the, the the husband would say i would rather change the wife rather than getting her treated i mean it, it's it's a very very you know crude comment but i i, I must say that that actually happened and uh, we did a project in, in, in an area of Gajak where uh, we, we like combed uh, six streets uh, targeting a population of around 2400 with the help of Nazam. And uh, that, that local Nazam actually, he knew each and everybody of that area. And 1400 people actually turned up for screening. There were still around 1000 people who did not turn up. Then we actually, with, the, with their support, went into their home and, and reached out to the female who and said, why you didn't get us, we can come, we can, we can, we can test you at home. They, you know, they, they refused. They, they were so firm in their refusal that we couldn't argue with them. And, and, and they, they said that you don't know what will happen. You know, I don't want to know. I would rather die, but I don't want to know. And the other thing is because in the initial stages, people do not have any symptoms. Uh, you know, they, they otherwise fit well, healthy, they are working. Uh, the other thing is, I think what we need to do uh, together is to, is to uh, sell stories of those people who have been successfully treated and they have been successfully bad. Uh, because what happens is uh, there are people who are diagnosed in their later stages of the disease they get treated, they get cured, they get rid of the virus. But unfortunately, because the liver is in a bad shape, one year or two years down the road, they land into problems uh, with complications of liver disease and at times development of liver cancer and requirement of liver transplant. So what happens is the story goes out. So what difference uh, the treatment made? So I got treated, but you know, again, I ended up with the same person so no, we have to, this negative propaganda, we have to, to fight this negative propaganda as well. So we have to come up with more stories, more success stories, which are huge. I mean, you know, the people, they have been successfully treated, they are doing very well, they, you know, 10 years down the road, 15, all of us, uh, you know, Dr. Huma, Professor Saeed, everybody, we all know that these people are there. So we need to make, uh, you know, these stories successful. The other thing is because uh, you know, uh, it's it's a bit lenient now, but still it happens. People uh, who go out to seek visa for uh, jobs in Middle East, they are tested and, you know, uh, like you have Kala Khan and you can't go there. They are refused visas. And uh, it, it still happens in, in a few corporate sectors, in, 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 a, in a few, in, uh, you know, uh, I, I still know, uh, the organizations where they test for hepatitis B and C and then people are discriminated because and this is one of the reasons people don't want to they don't want to let your employers know I know people who are who are our philanthropist also but they, if their driver gets tested uh, positive you know they uh, you know they don't want so we, we we need to come up with stories we, we have a cricketer in Pakistan, well known before the World Cup, he got tested, he got treated, he's still playing in PSL and still playing with Pakistani team. So we need to come up more of those stories, tell people, convince people that you have to get tested and get treated. Thank you. So uh, as a common pa Pakistani, as a lay person, I, if I watch television, I will definitely be inundated with messages about COVID and polio, typhoid, but hepatitis C is rarely talked about. Uh, yes, we've talked about AIDS, but why is that? Why aren't our media organizations or people who are in charge of national health campaigns not putting out a campaign about hepatitis C? Can anyone uh, share the experience or enlighten what the problems and barriers are? Why, Just like COVID, where we had such an intensive campaign, I understand the severity of the disease as well, but why can't we replicate that same campaign for hepatitis C? If I can, if I can just answer this very quickly, I think we are a proactive. Uh, sorry, we are a reactive nation reactive. rather than a proactive nation. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to be so 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 pessimistic. If it is an earthquake, we we are at our level best. If it's a, if it's COVID, we are at our uh, beautiful best. If it's dengue, we throw a lot of money at it because it's become 
such a big news item. Unfortunately, hepatitis C does not have any of those characteristics, right? It doesn't move mountains. It doesn't kill a lot of people in one go. Uh, it doesn't flood hospitals and the, and the health systems, and therefore it gets neglected. That's that's my just just my understanding of the whole thing. Dr. Huma, you wanted to add. Thank you, Dr. Saeed, and rightly so. These are, uh, you said they are gloomy facts, but they're also reality, and I think we need to face the reality. Yes, Dr. Huma, you wanted to add to this? Yeah, I, I think Saeed has uh, put in the right words, but I would maybe add some uh, more. Uh, I think it's also kind of donor driven. Uh, you know, like uh, COVID became a pandemic and being a, a pandemic, there was so much peer pressure from all over the world for the, for the vaccine, for the testing, for the PCR, for everything. And, you know, like uh, uh, I was just uh, discussing today and I thought that, you know, even in the, in the, in the diagnostics, uh, there is discrimination that you know the, um, uh, the gene expert is a machine which can give you the test for the PCR in about 90 minutes. And these people were making the cartridges for the hepatitis C. And then since the COVID, they got interested in making the COVID cartridges. So for the past six months, they are not producing the hepatitis C cartridges. So you, so you know, like what I'm just trying to say that, you know, everybody's jumping on the cart to, to make money. Uh, so, so they think that they will probably make more money using those, you know, building those cartridges. So they stopped producing the hepatitis C cartridges. And today I was kind of fighting with the CEO and I said, this is not right. We are all talking about the discrimination and the unjust and this is what you're doing here. So, you know, the HIV has a donor, the global fund. So there, there's a funder there. So, so HIV gets light uh, and, and support. But, but hepatitis is an orphan disease. Uh, there's, no, there's nobody to support it. Uh, so, so we have to fight our own uh, you know, way out. You have to present your to, stance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so so that, that's it. Thank you. All right. Uh, one of the uh, points that we've discussed is that uh, this is also caused by blood to blood transfusion. So in blood banks, uh, who is monitoring them? Are there any policies or frameworks that are implemented in Pakistan to ensure that at least the blood that is being transfused in a person that is properly checked, it's hepatitis free, hepatitis C free? Would anyone so, like to comment? Uh, yeah, I think I think I can probably answer this uh, because I've been kind of working with these blood bank people as a part of the hepatitis elimination uh, project. So you know, like uh, again, uh, bad policies, bad uh, you know administrative uh, work. That Pakistan uh, is a country where there are there are very few national blood banks, but there are many private blood banks. Uh, you know, anybody can open a blood bank. And if you open a blood bank and you start selling the blood, because, you know, many blood banks don't do, uh, you know, exchange uh, transfusion. They, they just kind of uh, have a donor, they pay them and they take the blood and give it to anybody. So this was going on for many years. And that was the reason that we didn't have the quality bloods for many years. And that was the reason that, we, and that is still the reason that we still have a very high prevalence of unscreened blood given to the population. But since past four or five years, uh, you know, there's again a collaboration with the German government where, they, where they're trying to not stop or, or closing the private blood banks, which are small blood banks, which don't have a very standard quality. And they're just now focusing on large standard private blood banks, which are attached to the universities or the colleges and the public sector government uh, blood banks. So, so the, 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 there is change coming in in Punjab, there is change we are seeing in uh, KP, uh, the, there is some change in Sindh also. Uh, so so we, will, we are seeing the change, but it's still not a 100% uh, thing which is done, but at least they have started to do it. Uh, so maybe, maybe in, the, in the future, we might have a really very uh, clean, nice blood, but as of today, uh, there's still a question mark of getting a very, very safe blood. Thank you. Uh, right, one, so point, one quick uh, point I would like to add here is, uh, is the indication for blood transfusion. Uh, people here in the villages, in, 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 in small towns, they literally beg that this, um, our mother is feeling weak, please transfuse blood. 
and and we see day in and day out uh, patients who don't have their hemoglobin test and just being given blood so that's where we need to educate people also it's a, after all it's a blood product there is always going to be a window period where where we may miss you know even even with, with all robust screening we may miss uh, you know uh, 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 an occult or hidden infection so that's what we need to do and don't uh, forget we are a nation with highest number of injections per person per year who says that you know three injections per person per year we are injecting somewhere along 30 to 15 injections per person per year because people won't feel satisfied with the tablet treatment is you know i am feeling we give me an injection i have fever give me an injection and that where the genetic and there are there are financial issues related to that and unfortunately we will not capture this monster or even even tackle this monster of hepatitis unless we take care of these aspects as well thank you uh very rightly so uh you've talked about how common man's perception is that if they go to a doctor and they just get tablets and they're not given injections they're not satisfied so i think at one point we also need to educate the common man and people themselves uh to ha have trust in their doctor and say no to lot of injections uh, i would like to uh, talk about another aspect we talked about uh, treatment in medicines so someone actually has asked us a question about uh, is there a helpline so if you know that you've been infected is there a helpline a national helpline or uh, an any sort of place that you can go to seek advice in treatment and then um, and related to that is that are there any models where digital health or e health have been used to uh, control the transmission and to manage this disease so who would like to take this question yes usman sir i can just briefly mention uh, yamla that there are multiple helplines but there's no one national integrated helpline you have ngos like parsa trust has a helpline that uh, you know is available to patients uh, i'm sure uh, institutions like aga khan also have an outreach program that includes availability of uh, as, as far as telemedicine is concerned you know there are some issues around legislation Uh, about the use of telemedicine to actually prescribe and treat patients. This is still being worked through through the healthcare commissions in the provinces. One of the challenges in Pakistan has been, and I think Dr. Homa referred to it when we spoke about uh, blood transfusions, is that when our uh, system devolved from a federal uh, system, federally administered healthcare system, to a provincial one, you suddenly had a, overnight a very abrupt change from a national, for example, blood transfusion authority. to several provincial ones that had to be created from scratch and in that gap a lot of uh, uh, you know cracks were created and things fell through and we're still trying to deal with the repercussions of that but i think it's an excellent question and an excellent suggestion uh, that there should be uh, a national very heavily advertised uh, helpline where people can call and get immediate access to information on where where therapy is available where diagnosis is available whatever their concerns are they can get an answer to uh, and Uh, one point i'd just like to reemphasize for the audience that dr said the bid was the the fact that the most important basic ingredient is political will and if you uh, you're a development consultant i am sure you sure you must have seen in the healthcare space the kind of difference a campaign like alif elan made in primary education where at the district level you you encourage the creation of pressure groups from parents demanding a better quality of education we need something similar like that in hepatitis c this is a disease that affects virtually every single household in the country every household will have at least one member who is affected by it which means if they start demanding that their dco should know exactly what today's prevalence is the chief minister should demand that data on a daily basis and get regular updates on what is being done about it in terms of treatment diagnosis reduction of prevalence this is exactly what happened in egypt in egypt it was done at the presidential level as professor hamid mentioned the president used to get a daily report on his desk in the morning about the state of hepatitis c in the country and it used to be district wise so that he could easily call out a certain district that wasn't looking at this problem closely enough and i think the other missing component i, I referred to it when i spoke initially that this is as much of a marketing and a communication problem as it is a medical problem that the mass communication angle and the involvement of celebrities we don't see that here as we did in egypt in egypt the football team the television stars the singers they all got involved they had tv serials about viral hepatitis 
So the, the mass media really play the central role. And I think those are some of the areas that we really need to explore uh, to basically find those missing billions who have hepatitis C in this country. Somehow we have to get to the point where they get tested and, and, and get treated and cured. And are there any other policy levels? So yes, one is political will, uh, which uh, I think is difficult to enforce. But yes, if there are pressure groups and proper advocacy, then you can get your decision makers on board. But at the policy level, do you think that, uh, because there are lots of policies from regulating blood banks to um, even for different ministries, you have devolution has also happened. It's been 11 years now. But uh, what policy recommendations would you want to give? Or you th still think that there are areas where policies are weak? So Yumna, maybe, maybe I, I can answer that. Uh, actually, <laughs> if you look around, there are, there are many policies which have been drafted and that they're there, but it's the question of implementation and we, we are very bad at implementation. So there, there are policy documents, very well made, very clear, very strong, but the implementation is not there. Over. Okay, so we have enough paperwork, we have enough reports to read. We just need people to understand that and to implement, which is not an easy task because as we've all said, a lot of stakeholders, a lot of ministries, a lot of departments, a lot of people. And then, yes, if, uh, if hepatitis C sold like COVID, then we would definitely be, we would have jumped on the bandwagon. We would definitely have taken more serious steps to address this issue. Uh, let's also talk about uh, the healthcare practitioners and the healthcare providers and the negligence that has happened there, or uh, what would you say to them? Uh, how many incidents, uh, is this like a valid concern? Are there incidents that are happening? Are we reporting that? On the uh, clinical side, how are we ensuring that our healthcare practitioners are using safe uh, methods, safe safety syringe methods or disposable methods? Yeah, um, I, I think, um... On paper, a lot of things exist, uh, but, uh, you know, the, I know the Punjab Healthcare Commission uh, has been working a lot on these things, but unfortunately, things become politicized, there is resistance, because there's a little bit addition to the cost. And, and don't forget, uh, uh, patients ask for injections and doctors encourage injections, especially in, in, in a primary care setting, because there are some financial gains that are, uh, uh, you know, uh, they're, they're linked with this in, uh, uh, injection practices. Um, if I remember correctly, for I think for 100 in injections being sold in the market, there are 70 syringes that have been sold. So that means there's definitely a reuse of syringes uh, there. Uh, a lot of things happen because uh, to, to encourage uh, to cut the needle and dispose them of properly, then they are auto-destructible uh, uh, syringes to be used. Uh, so, so these these exist in laws, these exist in papers, but unfortunately, when we come to the to the, the ground reality, they are not there. Uh, amongst the healthcare professional, awareness exists, but I think we have to take the message and 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 the whole awareness thing to the people as well, because they should know that this is wrong, and they should actually it's, it's the whole change of mindset that we are talking about. It's not going. Uh, to be very easy, but as we have worked in our ACO project with students, I think we're targeting grade five to grade 10 students, teaching them in maybe in a decade's time, things will start changing. Uh, so oh, we yeah, have Yumna, to... sorry, uh, Yumna, I'll just maybe add, add to what Asad has said, uh, that uh, there, there have been studies uh, done in Pakistan, uh, which show something very good on part of the government, that now there is hardly any syringe reuse in the government sector. In the hospitals, there are more syringes and less injections. But is the problem is in the private sector where there are more injections and less syringes. So, but regulation of the private sector is again another big question mark because you know how do you regulate them? And then there are health, uh, there are registered medical practitioners using the syringes. And there are, there, there are unregistered medical practitioners who are using the syringes. So that's the actual group which is producing the most trouble for us. It's not the, for, at least for one thing I can assure you, 
that in the hospital setting it is the bad unclean instruments that are causing the problem but in the private sector it is the syringes thank you so how and who is monitoring the private sector as you said okay syringes are the problem so who is now uh, having a look at the syringes the question okay. the wicked problem yeah. of syringes excuse me can yeah. i can i yeah. in, can say go go ahead i will add on to humas uh, uh, points fair enough huma there may not be uh, a, a reuse of syringes but what's happening about the medical waste who's looking after the medical waste that is generated in huge amounts in these public hospitals and private hospitals we don't have any incinerators to talk about so 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 i think that is where all the all the business happens of of uh, of the use of syringes maybe it is not being used in the, in the bigger uh, uh, public hospitals similarly i think what uh, perhaps soma was trying to say is the the reuse of syringes happens in these smaller clinics which are either gp run or even actually uh, 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 run by what you commonly called quacks uh, but but, but so, so that is where the problem is and these are in more in rural areas more in villages and small towns than in big places uh, but it is a, it is it is a real problem so Great. Right. Can, can I just uh, get another? Can I just get another question? And you know, I need to put you on the spot. You put us on the spot for quite some time now. Let let let's see if we can get something out of you. Uh, okay. Because time is running out. Well, I hope that we all of us, all three and four of us, have given you enough, or given the public, or whoever is listening to us, enough information about the background. what hepatitis c means to this country and what getting rid of hepatitis we have just talked about it what would getting rid mean for this country uh, the, the the estimations are that in you will end up uh, cost saving billions of dollars the the, the, the estimate is about maybe 7 or 8 billion dollars if you are able to eliminate hepatitis c from this from this country why because your workforce will be healthy your your productivity will go up etc 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 i am not a health economist but any any anybody can will tell you that the point that i was trying to make is and 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 i think we've talked about this uh, quite quite a lot in in this in this uh, hour is the communication 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 or lack of thereof so how is the national incubation center placed to help the the, the effort through through communication um and uh, you know through the social media or whatever we have not been savvy in using this can you help us in there i think uh, well, the national incubation team is there so they'd answer it but i would say that there's so much emphasis on digital marketing and digital media and digital storytelling and someone said let's record stories of survivors so i would say that uh, you have the communication tools you just need people to understand the problem and to devise messages that are appropriate and people understand because i i think that's also the problem the people who know the tools they don't understand the problem or the disease so i think a collaborative effort just like all of us have gathered here from different fields this is what's needed but uh, we're also running out of time so uh, may i have isha who can jump in the conversation and remind us of the hackathon and maybe we'll find solutions to these problems Sure, of course. Um, thank you, Yamna. Thank you to all our uh, panelists today. It was a great discussion. It was one of the most interactive discussions we've had, um, you know, in terms of the question and answers from the audience, and you know. um how all of you answered them very kindly so thank you very much yes the hackathon is you know so one of the many small efforts that we can do um in terms of uh, you know not only trying to find an innovative solution but with panel discussions such as the one that we arranged today we are able to create awareness we are able to let the common man know um not only about the menace that hepatitis c is but what would it mean if uh, we're able to tackle this if we're able to overcome this um unfortunately we've run out of time but before we sign off um i would like to ask suhir sir um if he could just say a few last few words um on behalf of team up and the national incubation center please thank you isha um, i just wanted to thank all of the panelists for some excellent points that they raised and Uh, wonderful comments very informative thank you so much for taking out the time uh, and um, 
putting yourselves in front of all these people. Um, I also wanted to thank our, our various partners, uh, significant ones, Firoz Sons Laboratories Limited, Abbott, Pepsi-Cola, Nestle, uh, and so many others. And it would take me a few minutes to go through all of them, but thank you to all of them for uh, coming together to support us on what I think is a very burning issue for Pakistan right now. As most of you have pointed out, it is something that we need to tackle, we need to address. And the hackathon will hopefully uh, bring some of these discussions to a more fruitful conclusion where we can sometimes look at these things and throw some technology at them in terms of the prevention, in terms of the detection, and, and the management of the problem. Uh, and I look forward to uh, having those discussions with you guys in the, in the future as well, inshallah. Isha has all the details and obviously our website as well contains all the de details as well. Uh, thank you again. I will take up more of your time. Thank you, Zuhair Saab. Um, thank you to all the attendees who joined us today. Our deadline is the 18th of uh, July, so you still have uh, three more days to apply. Uh, we have some wonderful cash prizes. They've all been announced on our social media and on our landing page. You can apply um, by going to the landing page that is on the National Information Center's website. Um, we look forward to receiving your applications, and hopefully we come up with a solution to eradicate this problem. Thank you so much to all the panelists. Thank you, Zuhair Saab. Thank you very much. This is it. Love this. Thank you. Love this.